Hey everyone and welcome back to another video from Amar Talks NRL Supercoach. Today we're going to go through the round 4 trade targets, burning questions and overall preview. Uh, we had our first price changes so are we jumping too late on some guys or can we find the next pod who's going to go up in price? Let's find and discuss all of those things so if you enjoy the video really appreciate a thumbs up. Do please consider subscribing as well to the channel if you haven't already and let's get straight into it. So in hindsight, I have to give a quick shout out to a page called Queenslander who commented on my last week's video. Um, and if any of you didn't watch my Sunday stream, I did a little poem about Nico Hines. Yeah, in hindsight, Sam Walker to Nico Hines probably should have been the move that I had done last week. I didn't do it. He killed it again, 124 points I believe he scored. He's now gone up to 744k, break even of 12. The, the draw is not too bad overall. Apart from the storm in round six, I'm not really too concerned about any of those matchups. Um, the chart below him is proving the different ways that he can score points, good base, uh, goal kicking, very involved in the try assist creativity side of things. Um, and a lot of you do agree with me that it's not too late to jump on Nico Hines. If, for example, you're someone like me who's got Sam Walker and is strongly considering maybe switching to Nico Hines, I, I don't think it's a bad move just because the couple, there's a couple of reasons why. So firstly, it's the low break even, and he's got the two rolling tons now in his average. So the price is definitely going to be increasing. So this week does kind of feel like the last week. Otherwise, you're probably going to be paying more than 300k to go from someone like a Sam Walker or Luke Keery up to Nico Hines. It's also dual listed. So the fact that he can get him at both fullback and halfback just means if you're worried about, say, someone like Nathan Cleary just uh, sitting there below me, peeping out of the screen... If, for example, you want to go for Hines, I still think there are ways that you can go for Nathan Cleary. Ideally, we probably want to have a halves combo of both Cleary or Hines. The beauty of Nico Hines is that because he's dual listed between halfback and fullback, if you actually want to get Nathan Cleary in, you can actually just trade out one of your underperforming fullbacks. Say, for example, a Tedesco, the nice draw is coming up, but say he's just not killing it as what you would have hoped. You can flip Nico Hines down to fullback and then instead get Cleary for Tedesco. So there are ways that you can kind of maneuver potentially around getting the pair of them in. Obviously, Cleary, I think I would probably personally wait on Nathan Cleary. I would prefer just to go for Hines right now just because we know that he can score under the current rules. I have complete faith that Cleary probably can, but you're also paying like 100, 200k more for Nathan Cleary in comparison. And he's just coming off a shoulder injury, so there's some slight concerns there. Whereas uh, someone like Nico Hines, the ownership is starting to soar up as well. So I feel like if you're not going to go get him and you're going to death ride him, if he does score well, it's going to be really punishing. I, for one, am happy to swallow my pride and say I made a mistake not going for him last week. And I'm trying to make some moves to get him into my team because he's almost looking close to a must-have. The way that he's accumulating the points, he's probably not going to score a ton every week. But say, look at round five, he's probably going to be a very strong captain consideration there. So his points would hurt even more if you're a non-owner. And so I think with that low break even, those couple of reasons how I think the flexibility helps you maybe potentially get Cleary in in other ways makes me lean towards going with Hines. And I don't think I'd be rushing to get Nathan Cleary just because the price is very high. There likely probably would be a price drop. Um, I would maybe guess that his average would probably drip, uh, dip down to say maybe 80, 85, which is still a fantastic average, but he will lose money even at that um, scoring average. So I think waiting on Cleary is my kind of adopted strategy. I think I'm going to try instead make some moves to go for Nico Hines. And I think he is probably the best trade target for this week. And it was the same as last week. I think if you can get him in, um, I don't even mind doing switches of, say, Luke Curie, Sam Walker, Jerome Hughes, just because he's looking a cut above in the halfback position. So kind of following on from this argument, some people would say maybe the boat has actually shipped on Nico Hines. Maybe instead you save, say, close to 100 k Go for someone like a Cam Munster who has not yet changed price, but he's got a very low break even of 7 and a very nice draw coming up as well. There is an argument to say, instead of going for Hines, I'm instead going to go for Cam Munster, who I think can score similarly, or even just, or even better, um, and also capitalize on probably what looks like a slightly better draw. So the scoring-wise between the two, I mean, it's a small sample size, so I wouldn't read too much into it, but there are some similarities. So the average is very, very similar, only one point different. Uh, Base-wise, Munster just edges out, but not by a whole lot. Um, the scoring did bump up for Munster. The thing with Munster is that he's not going to score a try every week. Neither is Nico Hines, but Hines is goal-kicking. So I have a lot more confidence that his scoring is going to be you know, more steady than, say, someone like a Cam Munster. Munster is going to kind of rack up those tackle break stats. So you see the evasiveness numbers are really high for Munster, but he had like 11 tackle breaks or something last week. We know that he can break a lot of tackles, but uh, I'm not going to see that every week from him. So I think there's a couple of stat areas with Munster that I think can have the potential to dip down. Whereas with Hines, we've got a one extra game sample size. And I feel like a lot of those stats are very st like stable or like repeatable. So I just feel like Hines, 
is in my eyes a better trade target than say someone like a Cam Munster. For those other reasons that I mentioned, the price is just going to get really, really high and probably something I should have mentioned. If, for example, you do want to go for Cleary, Heinz could just be that perfect stepping stone. You know, you can jump on now, capitalize on like hopefully another 100, 150k of rises. And maybe you just make that switch if Heinz starts to falter, doesn't look like he's kind of demonstrating the same form that he's shown already. And then he could be the perfect makeway for Nathan Cleary. And I think with Munster, even though there aren't a lot of other good 5'8 options, there are a couple, say like a Dylan Brown, he's averaged around 69 to begin the season. So he's kind of, well, he's clearly not matching Munster, but he's a lot cheaper as well. Uh, or you can maybe stick with, say, if you do want to continue holding on to Sam Walker, um, in a couple of weeks, he should actually get the 5'8 um, eligibility added to his uh, profile. So he should actually be available at 5'8. So the potentially are all the alternatives. I'm not going to make it a secret though that Munster is the standout 5'8. But in terms of say which one of the two you want to prioritize, even though there is a big price difference, I think I would capitalize on Nico Hines instead. I just don't see Munster hitting 121, you know, all the time. Not that Hines is going to get 124 all the time. But in terms of a Nico Hines, I think he has that greater consistency to be able to actually reach those 100 plus scores just because that the spread of his points, I think, is a lot more widespread than, say, like a Munster. And also, I think the scores that he's got so far are a lot more sustainable than, say, Munster, where he had a big 120 game, but a lot of that was down to a lot of tackle breaks, which I don't think he's going to get every week. Someone like a Hines, he'll get the goal kicking. He'll have his hand in tries. Now, Munster probably actually does increase his points from the try assist side of things because I don't think he's actually had that many to begin the year. But... Yeah, I'm personally just think, thinking Heinz is the bigger priority. If you can squeeze him in, look, alternatively, if you just can't get to Heinz and you instead veer away to, say, like a monster, that's not a bad kind of fallback option in, in all honesty. But I think if you're just deciding between one of the two, I personally would go with Nico Heinz. Now, the next topic that I wanted to get into was the front row forward because it's really been an area where we haven't had a lot of gun performers. So in the table below me, there are three front row forwards who've averaged over 70. Two are Zay Papali'i and Payne Haas, and the other is James Tamo, who's only played one game and that scored a try. So I didn't really want to consider him, in, I guess, in the list here. And there are four, including those three who've scored over 60 average. So that's adding in Tino for Sumula Awi. In comparison to, say, like a second row forward or a center wing, you've got six who are averaged over 70, 16 uh, in total over 60 average, five in the center wing over 70, and then 17 over the 60. Now, I didn't want to get into the hooker, halfback, and fullback spots just because I think if, say, you're looking to make moves with your front row forward, realistically, I think most people would be able to switch to a second row forward via duels, and then again, maybe to a center wing via duels as well. We're just not seeing that many good front row forward options. I think Payne Haas, if you've got him, great. I'm very happy I've got him just because he is probably the best front row forward alongside with Isaiah Papali'i. Now, Papali'i is a lot more expensive at 686k, but he's actually been able to kind of maintain his price tag. Payne Haas was uh, 595k, so he has gone up just in the most recent week. So I think eventually we want, we want to get to a Papali'i Haas combo, but Papali'i at 686k is a lot of money. Like I'd prefer to go for someone like a Munster or a Harry Grant who are cheaper in their own positions. And so my general sentiment with the front row forward is unless you've got, say, like an injury, say, for example, like a Stefano or Tukumanu, then I would make moves for sure. But again, if you're trying to go to, like, say, a gun option with Oitikamanu, it's really hard to say who is the best one. My recommendation is to probably go for Papali or Haas if you can stretch up that way. But then I'm even thinking I'd actually rather just spend my money on those more attacking players and, and for, you know, think about it a little bit later on in the season about upgrading your front row forward. So around a similar price range, I'd probably say Jai Arrow just because he's actually done pretty well over the first three rounds. You know, he's averaging 59. The base and power is at 60. The only issue with him is that he did better in the first two weeks. And then last week, he played only 56 minutes in comparison to, say, like 70 and 75 the weeks prior. That coincided with the return of Liam Knight. So there's even question marks around Jai Arrow. Adam Fennell Blake is not doing very well. Takiaho has actually kind of gone under the radars, average 60 in the first three rounds of the year. Uh, but whether or not that's sustainable, it's a bit of a question mark whether you want to take the punt or not like 517k, you can instead go for someone like a Daniel Tupo who has a nice draw coming up and it just feels like a lot better bang for your buck instead of going high priced in your front row forward. So my general sentiment is if you're sticking with say like a Payne Haas, Adam Fennell Black combo, unless you have no other issues in your team, then I'd probably say it's fine to do like an Adam Fennell Black down to your cheaper front row forward to create funds. So say for example, like a Josh King, Max King, maybe even a Leah Thompson from the Knights. I think these are all nice downgrade options. But if they're not the biggest priority in your team, I would just stick with what you've got because no one is really standing out. 
And I think it's better just to sit on it, save your trades, and then if a standout comes into the fold, you know, like a good cheapie, then you can use your trades to make those moves. But overall, uh, I will just leave it as is. But if you are an Oichi Kamano owner and you've got a little bit of extra money in the bank, I would just go for Jai Arrow because he's done decently well over the first three rounds. The Rabbitohs draw does actually open up as well from round five. So if he is named on an edge and plays, you know, some decent minutes there, there could be some attacking upside, but I wouldn't bank on it. And it's just also the fact that he's the cheapest of the lot. So you're just limiting how much you're actually spending there. Otherwise, I would say spend down, go to Josh King, Max King, and Leo Thompson, and free up the funds elsewhere. Now, the next topic of discussion was Stags and Cobo. Are they a sell or are they a hold? So I own the pair of these guys, and it's been very, very frustrating. Um, I like the signs that I saw in round one, so I thought I'd take the chance on Cobo. That has not worked out. The past two rounds, they haven't really done much, and they're kind of coming, coming to the end of their nice run of games. So they've got the Warriors this week, who have actually conceded quite a few points down the left edge. So if you're in the hold argument, there's a good chance that they can actually score well this week. Uh, you know, they've already copped a bit of a price drop for the pair of them. I personally, though, am in the sell camp, especially when you've got guys like, say, a Taylor May who are ready made. Now, Taylor May is not going to actually go up in price this week. He'll go up next week when he plays again, um, you know, barring any injury concerns. But I think doing someone like a Stags down to Taylor May frees you up like 150k. And then if that's your, say, read money to Harry Grant funds, easy. I would 100% be doing those moves. If you've got no other pressing issues and you can afford to sit on it for another week, I think they do have the potential to score well this week. But I feel like we've been saying that though the past few weeks. So my faith in them has definitely dwindled quite dramatically. Um, I probably won't sell both of them. Um, I'd more likely sell Stags just because he's higher priced and I can get more um, money out of selling him compared to say like a Cobo who's quite cheap. So I can afford to kind of just let him sit on my bench. I could maybe take a chance and play one of them uh, against the Warriors, just hoping for the matchup. But I've done that in the past couple of weeks and it hasn't really worked out. And then rounds five and six, it's the Roosters and then the Panthers. Bulldogs haven't even been that bad defensively. And then it's the Sharks. So the run of nice games is definitely ending. And so look, you can definitely hold this week. But as I mentioned, if those downgrades facilitate nice upgrades elsewhere, I'd be very comfortable selling them. The potential is there, but unless we see it happen, I'm not going to be too worried about selling either of these two. Now, next up, I want to be talking about uh, Reed Marnie. So I just kind of referenced it in the last section there. I think people are definitely uh, cutting ties with Reed Marnie. He just hasn't delivered on what we thought he could deliver on, uh, you know, based on what we saw from last season. The attacking stats have just not been there. The base is also very down, which is very concerning. You can see he's only averaging 33 base. And the break even of 74, his highest score so far this year has been like, what, 57? And that included a try. I don't have much faith that he'll actually meet that. Now, it is a nice matchup against the Dragons, but he's had good matchups so far already, and it hasn't really worked out. So I've got four guys here who I think are very good replacements. Now, Harry Grant, I don't really need to spend too much time, I think, talking about Harry Grant. I think we know how good of an option he is. Now, in terms of team lists, he was start named to start uh, with Brandon Smith on the bench. Now, I've seen a few kind of comments and things about what people are thinking in terms of the actual game day rotation. People are thinking that Nelson, Osofa, Solomona will go down to the bench. Josh King will move to prop and then uh, Brandon Smith moves into lock. I could see that potentially be a situation that happens. But I saw another good suggestion that was they might just like Brandon Smith to come off the bench because if he started, he can't play the full 80 minutes. So if he started, he play like, say, I don't know what, 20 minutes, go off for a spell and then come back on. That actually uses like one or two substitutions for the storm as, to per as opposed to, say, just keeping him on the bench. And then when he comes on, they can just play him out and actually saves him the substitution. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if actually Smith stays on the bench there. And with Grant, I don't really think I'm too worried about what the minutes will be like. Even if he plays 60, 65 minutes, that was his average minutes last season. And he still was like close to being the, the top averaging hooker. He's just that much of a better option than any other, uh, any other hooker. If you can go money to Grant, I would 100% advocate it. You're locking in a gun who is the best in their position. Now, someone like me, who's actually looking to instead bring in, say, like a Heinz, I do think Heinz is a bigger trade target than a Harry Grant. I am strongly considering some of these cheaper hooker options because even though I don't have to sell Reed money, I can just hold him for the week. I'm also concerned about cash generation. It seems like a lot of our overpriced guns are losing money, and so I think cash generation is still important. So I am thinking about maybe doing a money downgrade to, say, like a Blake Braley or a Tom Starling. Blake Braley's already gone up 54k, which is a bit annoying, <laughs> um, but he's still got a low break even of 12. And just referencing the Sharks draw from earlier, he's got the Knights this week, and then it's the Tigers. I still think he can do well in either of those two games. He's playing decent minutes, you know, he played 80 in the first two games, and then um, I think 75 in the third game. He didn't actually get spelled for that long, 
uh, even though Trindle was on the bench there. And he did pick up a try assist. Now the next two games are pretty nice in terms of an attacking point of view, so there could be more try assists. Just the base is very nice as well, 47 base over the first three games. So already his base average is higher than Reed's Marnie's average. And you're saving, what, let me do some quick math there, 70k. And you're capitalizing on potentially more cash growth as well. I think I plugged in that if he averages 60, he should hope to make about an extra kind of 80 to 100k, which for me, it could just be a way of doing a bit of a stepping stone to Harry Grant. I might not be able to get him in straight away just because I'm already looking to spend up big to Nico Hines, but instead going down to someone like a Blake Braley, I am strongly considering. I could even also consider a Tom Starling, who's a lot cheaper, also has a low break even of eight. The thing with Starling though was that he was benched last week. Now he has been named to start, but the same game day rotation could happen where he's again named on the bench, but it could just be a case of, say, they don't think he can play the full 80 minutes, so start him on the bench, and then when he gets subbed on, he just plays the rest of the game out, and that actually means that the Raiders can save a substitution. So I still expect him to be playing around the 60-minute mark. He did get some attacking stats last week, which did boost his score up to 70. So the base average, it's a bit lower than, say, like Blake Bradley, who I've got a little bit more faith in that his floor is higher, but it is 100k. Now, I've got a few questions below me in terms of the ideal hooker combination. I think it's probably going to be a Harry Grant and then either a Braley or a Starling. I personally would think of Braley just because I think his base is higher. So I think the floor's uh, a little bit more secure than someone like a Starling. Although Starling does look quite electric in all honesty. So I think you can definitely flip a coin between the two. The 100k saving could just mean you sway towards a, a Tom Starling. Number two is will Brandon Smith impact Grant's minutes? As I've touched on, I'm not even worried about that too much. We could even consider Brandon Smith as a trade-in option. The thing with him, though, is that the break-even is still fairly high at 82, just because he still has that number one score in his rolling average from round one. Come next week, though, he could drop in price a little bit, and then he could become a bit more of a serious consideration. The dual listing also does help in the fact that you can pick him up at second or forward, uh, as well as the hooker spot. But the minutes, I'm not really too concerned. I think Grant, even in 60-65, can still do well. The benefit of going for Grant is that it just saves your future trade. You're locking in the best gun option at hooker. Um, and I've kind of already referenced question four there about you know the, the potential benefits of going with Braley and Starling. So for myself, I'm actually quite keen on someone like a Blake Braley. I think he's shown good signs. I like the Sharks overall. They've really impressed me to begin the year. And so Braley, I'm thinking, could be a nice little stepping stone to Harry Grant in the future, just because I think with the moves I'm looking to do this week, I'm not quite sure if I can get straight to Harry Grant, but I very easily could just go for Tom Starling and create a bigger bank. Maybe potentially that could be my Nathan Cleary funds. But personally, yeah, I think Marnie is a sell. Even if you don't have to do it this week, I'm very keen on selling, even with a good matchup, just because I think there are enough good options at hooker cheaper than him that it can help you raise funds and use elsewhere. Now, we've already had our first hit of price rises, but there's still quite a few options that will have low break even who so couldn't continue to make money. And so I wanted to address this in its own section, just to kind of also address that question of, you know, is it too late to jump on some of these guys? Broadly, a lot of these guys, no, I don't think it's too late on. So say, for example, a Bo Fermor, uh, a Nanai, uh, a Josh King, a Max King. I don't think any of those guys, it's too late to jump on. As I touched on, I think cash generation is going to be very important, especially with a lot of our gun players seemingly being overpriced based on 2021 averages being so high um, and a bit of an outlier. So Bo Fermor, I really like for the fact that he's dual listed. The base and power floor is pretty decent at 45. You know, if you can plug that in your center wing, um, that's very steady. And I think we could be going a bit of a throwback to say, having our center wings filled with uh, second row forwards um, who are listed in our center wing. So say like a Ewan Aitken, a Bo Fermor, um, you can even look to say someone like Tar Targo, even though he's not actually playing the second row forward, he's playing in center wing, but you kind of get what I mean. And then I, I really like the look of him as well. Looked very, very electric in that last game, scored a hat trick uh, of which none included a line break. The floor is a little bit lower than, say, like a Bo Fermor at 39 points, but he's already shown that he has the attacking upside. I am very filthy at myself that I didn't have Nanai to start with, and I had Luki, and I was driving my car when the round one team list came out and Luki was benched, and I couldn't make the switch just because you're not supposed to use your phone. Um, although I could have stopped on the side of the road, but I don't want to think about that now because that just pains me because Nanai is proving to be a much, much better option than Luki was, and I definitely don't think it's too late for him. The Cowboys draw actually still pretty good for the long term. The Titans is not as good, but for more being a back rower, I don't think it affects him as much. So I think both of them are still very viable trade-ins. If I had to pick one of the two to bring in, I'd probably actually bring in Bo Fermor. I just like the fact that he is dual listed and his floor is a little bit higher than Nanai. Now Teague Wilton, I've seen a few people asking about Wilton. Is he a trade-in? 
Uh, the break even is very good, you know, minus 29. There's definitely going to be some cash growth there. My concern with him, though, is the, the job security. Wade Graham should be coming back in the next week or two, and I'd expect Wilton to drop either into the centers or even just straight to the bench, where I don't think he's going to be as good of an option. And I think just for a tick, you know, over 10K more, I will just get Bo Fermor instead. Now, Josh King and Max King, I think, are still very good trade-in options. Now, Josh King has been named to start, but due to storm rotation, you know, in the coming weeks, could maybe go back to the bench. But even though he's averaged 65 minutes thus far, even if he drops that down to, say, like 45 to 50, I still think that hopefully means his PPM will go up a little bit more. He actually showed some attacking upside, setting up a try last week with some offloading as well. And I think especially at front of forward, as we previously touched on, you know, if you've got no other moves really elsewhere in your team, or, for example, the money of, say, like a Fanul Blake who's been underperforming down to Josh King, lets you do like a Nico Hines upgrade. I'd be a very big advocate of that move. Josh King's price is moving in the right direction. Someone like Fanul Blake's moving in the wrong direction. So uh, I still think that Josh King is a viable trade-in. I don't think you've missed the boat there. I still think there is decent money to be made. Similar with Max King, you know, 250k is still a cheap price. And especially with Hetherington's injury from the Bulldogs, uh, Max King could have some additional minutes there. Just keep an eye on him though. He had a bit of an injury uh, concern about him last week, which is why he played less minutes. So with him, I would just be wary of that just before you actually look to bring him in this week. See if there's some updated news from say like NRL Physio or the Bulldogs. Um, you know, say for example, he's out this week, then you can afford to wait an, an extra week on it. Now we can afford to wait an extra week as well with Taylor and May. He's only played one game, but boy, he looked good in that game, didn't he? Scored a hat-trick, um, good base power of 35. He's very similar to, say, like a Brian Toto. Now, the break-even is obviously fantastic, minus 49. He won't change in price this week, though. It'll be next week. I still think, though, he's a viable trade-in this week. Just because the Panthers left edge, Nathan Clear is returning. I still think that could be a lot of points on offer, and I think he's a definite play in your starting center wing. So for that reason, like I think I've got more, much more confidence in him than say like a Cobo. So if you're doing like a Cobo down to May to free up some funds, I'd be very confident doing that move this week. I know the unwritten rule is that you don't bring in um, cheapies before their third game, just in case of an injury. But I think if it's letting you facilitate other moves, uh, I do like the Taylor May trade in, and it's probably one that I'm also going to be doing. And Brad Schneider, uh, I think, is looking like a great cash cow option. Scored 79 last week. I didn't reserve him because I'm a fool, but I won't be making that mistake again. He's got a nice floor because his base and power average is 36. Add on, say, like 10 points in goal kicking. And you're looking at like a 45 floor from someone like Schneider. So very easily can um, plug him in in terms of your starting 17. And even at his floor average of, say, around 45, Schneider would get up to about 400k within the next like kind of four to five rounds. I did a bit of calculations. So... He's looking like a fantastic uh, cash cow option. If you're someone who's sitting with, say, like a Sam Walker and Nico Hines combination, I don't actually think it's a bad move going from Hines, sorry, going from Sam Walker down to Brad Schneider. I just think it just lets you create a lot of money. And that could just be a perfect stepping stone, having initial money created from the Sam Walker down to Schneider. And then the money that Schneider is going to make, it just could main, mean that you could very easily get in someone like a Nathan Cleary in the future. And that lets you keep Nico Hines, get that kind of what looks like the kind of optimal halves combina combination of Cleary and Hines. So I, I wouldn't even mind doing downgrades like that to someone like Schneider because the point scoring does still seem to be there with that nice floor. So I think he's looking like a great cash cow if you haven't got him in already. And that, just to kind of wrap it up, there's a few that I haven't mentioned here. The guys like, say, Isaac Targo. I didn't really want to speak about these guys because I thought it was like, it was obvious that you should have someone like Targo, but if you don't have Targo, um, he's also looking like a fantastic option to plug into your starting 17. So hands down, definitely buy Isaac Targo as well if you don't own him already. Now, next section, I wanted to discuss the Sydney Roosters a little bit more in detail, and I'll try to do this a little bit more often. I think it'll keep us in check in terms of analyzing teams as a whole. So for example, next week, I'll probably do something similar with say the Rabbitohs, because that's when their draw really opens up. Roosters have been very interesting. You know, they've kind of faltered a little bit. You know, they had that upset loss to the Knights in round one. Then they lost to the Rabdos, although Rabdos are a good team and they always kind of fire up for that match against the Roosters. So the results, apart from that Knights one, haven't been overly shocking. They just haven't clicked as much as I think like myself and what other people thought they would to begin the year. Part of that could just be that they're learning new combinations with, say, Kiri, Sam Walker and Tedesco. I think Walker and Kiri have actually shown good science together, though. So I'm not actually that concerned about, you know, that combination, of, you know, flourishing. But just taking a quick look at their draw from rounds four to nine, it looks unreal. And I also wanted to consider the points per game that's actually been conceded by each of these teams. And it kind of just reaffirmed what I felt on paper that... You know, teams like the Broncos, Warriors, Dragons, and Titans, 
they are teams that do leak a lot of points or have done so far this year. But what has been surprising is teams like the Bulldogs and then the Cowboys. Cowboys have actually been pretty decent defensively. Although I will note that the Cowboys have actually had a very soft draw to begin the first three weeks, so that's definitely part of it. I think the Roosters can still definitely score a lot of points against the Cowboys, but the Cowboys are looking overall a little bit better. And similar narrative with the Bulldogs, they're not scoring a lot of points, but they're not letting in a lot of points either. But say, for example, this week will be a good litmus test as they come up against the Storm. And if the Storm pile on, say, like 40 points, then we might be thinking, okay, fine, the Bulldogs can kind of keep it low scoring in, you know, team against those middle of the range teams. But when they come up against the best, then they do concede a lot of points. So I think it's still comfortable to uh, invest in those attacking assets from the Roosters based on the upcoming draw. But I've put a bit of a traffic light system in place here, just in terms of my opinion on players, whether you should hold, whether you should buy, or whether you should sell. More or less, I think most of them are holds. Say, for example, if you're holding on to the likes of, say, a Tedesco, um, a Billy Smith, uh, a Joey Manu, or a Tupo, I think they're old holds. I even think that someone like Tupo is a buy, just because his price is pretty cheap at 520k. You know, if you're trading out someone like a Katoni Staggs, I think he's a nice kind of more, not premium, but, you know, a little bit more pricey center wing, bit of a pot option. He's averaged 60 so far this year. Um, and bearing in mind, two of those games have been a little bit tougher. I think Tupo could be a good beneficiary of this draw. So I really like him as a buyer. You could say the same thing for Manu, but I probably do prefer Tupo just a tad. Um, and Billy Smith is a nice cheap option. Hopefully he keeps his spot for a little bit longer. Um, but who knows, Suwali could come back and then that could actually mean that Billy Smith has lost his spot. The only two options I've really thought of maybe sells are Kiri and Sam Walker. And that's only really because I think if you can get to say like a Munster or a Hines, I think it's worth the move. Otherwise, I'd probably also just say that there are holds. But it's just the fact that those upgrades can be so big elsewhere in your halves in 5'8". And Walker and Kiri super coach wise, you know, 41 and a 40 average, just not quite delivering on what we thought. Now, I would expect those averages to increase with this nice draw coming up. But even Sam Walker, I'm thinking in my head, maybe like a 65, 70 average. I don't think we're going to be quite seeing like those 160 point games that you were seeing last year, just because of the overall scoring. And so if, say, for example, if I can go from a Walker who's averaging 41, maybe to a Hines who averages, I think maybe 75 to 80, it's a 20 point difference in average I'm thinking in my head. So I think that's probably worth the move. And say Kiri, I would guess maybe a 55 average, just, you know, subtracting it a little bit because he's not goal kicking like Walker is. Say a Munster averages 75 in my head. I think that's also worth the move, you know, a 20 point upgrade in average. Someone like Tedesco, I'm not as comfortable selling for Heinz just because I think Tedesco still is the main man. And I think the majority of the attacking stats or the tries that the Roosters get, I think he's going to have some contribution in it. Whereas someone like Walker and Kiri, I feel like it could be shared a little bit, you know, say it's down the right side. I feel like Teddy's always going to be there on the right or the left, but then only one of Kiri and Walker are going to be there. So that's why I'm more confident in holding someone like Tedesco, but I'm more okay with selling the halves, just because I do think they are kind of sharing responsibilities a little bit. I mean, I would say Kiri is a predominant kind of playmaker there, but um, yeah, that's my kind of overall opinion, I think, on those Roosters options. Um, I still think if you can hold, great, because the draw coming up is really good. But say Walker and Kiri out for like a Heinz or a Munster, I'm on board with those moves. Now we'll take a look at the market activity, although I tried to cover off a lot of these options like already and kind of give my thoughts. So hopefully you don't have to spend too long taking a look at it. But looking at the top trade outs, a lot of them make sense to me. Luke Kiri, as I mentioned, is a top traded out option. He's just not looking the best. So if you can take him out for a Heinz or a Munster, I do agree with that. Ethan Bullimore named again on the bench. I think that experiment is unfortunately over. And so I think, you know, if you got him in front row forward, Bullimore to Max King, Bullimore to Josh King, I think are two great moves. If you got him at second or forward, you can maybe move him down to say like a Tua Luggy, who's been named back in the starting lineup for the for the Tigers. Um, but yeah, generally, I do think that those uh, options are better than Bullimore, and I think he's a very easy trade. Talatau Amon, I've seen him being traded out quite a lot. In all honesty, I never, I haven't just, I haven't noticed him in my super coach team. I haven't played him once. Um, he only dropped like 1k. From memory, his break even is not super high. So I think he's not going to hopefully drop too much more in cash. And I still think that he can deliver points. You know, he scored like 49 points against the Panthers. So I think it's just going to be one of those volatile options. Now, obviously, an Amon down to a Taylor May, if say you're happy with the other center wings that you've got, I think that moves fine. But that probably could hold off another week potentially. Um, so I necessarily don't necessarily think he's a must sell. But look, if that's facilitating other moves, then I can definitely get behind that logic. Angus Crichton being named on the bench again for the Roosters, I think that just means he is a sell. Now, I didn't really discuss him so much so far, but someone like Nat Butcher, maybe is he the IPAP, Isaiah Papali'i of 2021, you know, a bench forward who gets thrown into the starting lineup, 
and just stays there. Who knows? I'm not looking at bringing in that butcher in this week, but it is definitely something I'm trying to keep an eye on because I'm traditionally very bad at identifying these players and getting on them early. I'm always a little bit late to the party, so Nat Butcher, I'm keeping an eye on him, but yeah, Crichton, I do think it's a sell, especially at that price of 606k. Um, we'll discuss him in a little bit, but you can see in the top traded in players, Cameron Murray, I think that's a great switch from Crichton to Murray. Murray's looking the goods, and the draw really opens up from round five as well for Murray. Tony Staggs, I've given my thoughts on him. I'm confident and comfortable selling him. Uh, same with Terrell Sloan. The draw is tough for the for the Dragons, and his base is just not that high. You know, in comparison to, say, like a Zach Lomax, who I'd be saying is fine to hold and is a decent replacement as well for Tony Staggs. I do think that the Sloan, yeah, I don't think he's a great option to hold just because of that poor base. And I think maybe someone who hopefully drops a bit in cash and you can pick up when the draw opens up for the Dragons. Reed Miney, I think I've made my feelings quite clear. I think he's fine to sell. Uh, same with Oich Kamanu. It looks like he's out for about six to eight weeks, so that's a very easy sell there as well. Uh, Jackson Hastings rounding out the top 10 there. He's still going to be gone for two games, and I think there's enough options at halfback and 5'8 that you can move to um, to you know warrant a sell. Uh, Jerome Hughes is a bit of an interesting one. He did score very highly in round one, but we've seen when Munster and Grant have come back, his scoring has dipped a little bit. The thing with the Storm, though, is that any of their playmakers can score at all times. Like, for example, Pappenhausen, uh, Brandon Smith, and Munster all scored centuries last week. So I don't necessarily think that just because they're back is going to impact Jerome Hughes scoring, but I think I imagine most people are selling Jerome Hughes for Hines, and I do think that is a good upgrade. So I don't mind seeing him on that top 10 sell, sold list, um, you know, if you're making way for a Nico Hines. Now, looking at the top trades in, honestly, I don't really need to make a comment about each of them specifically, just because I think more or less I agree with it, except for, say, number 10. You know, Tom Dearden, look, he's done very well for the first three rounds, and he scored his ton last week. But at, what, 450k, I would just maybe think about, say, if you're going at 5'8", I prefer Dylan Brown. Um, I've got Dylan Brown currently in my side. I really like the draw for the Eels coming up. Um, his base is very high, so I think he's going to give you less worse scores. And again, maybe it's my fault that I'm not good at identifying these players who are having a breakout season. I'm just not seeing it at the moment with, with Dearden. So I feel like that's it's similar to say like Clifford last week. A lot of people bought Clifford last week. I didn't think he was the worst trade-in, but he kind of reminded you of like the fact that he's not always going to score well. I kind of feel like Dearden's falling into that same category. So I'm not overly keen on that as a trade-in, but everyone else on that list, you know, one to nine, I can get on board with that. Definitely a few options in there that I am targeting myself as well this week. Now, taking a look at round four captaincy, to me this week, it's actually not overly difficult. Um, in terms of putting a vice captain option, you've got Fafida and Hines, who I think are the two standouts with their nice fixtures on paper. Fafida plays on the Thursday night and Hines does on the Friday. Now, Hines could very easily even just be a captaincy option, but I think we've got another enough good matchups elsewhere that we can put the captaincy on someone else. So I think for my own team at the moment, I've got the VC on Fafida, but if I do bring in Nico Hines, I'll definitely slap the VC on him, I think, instead. And then in terms of captaincy, I think... Someone from the Storm, say for example a Pappenhausen or a Munster. I haven't included Grant just because he actually might not play that full 80 minutes. So with Pappenhausen and Munster, Pappenhausen potentially should be goal kicking still. Pappenhausen and Munster, I think against the Bulldogs, both cracked a ton last week. So I think very safe captain options. Otherwise, you could go with Tedesco, you know, away to the Cowboys. But as I showed previously, Cowboys have been okay defensively. So I'm not sure if I'm confident captaining Tedesco. I think I'd probably just stick with the VC for Fido Hines and then put a captaincy on a Storm player later in the week. I've also got Tom Trevojevic there, but not overly confident with that. I've just, I feel like I've just always got to include him just because when you've got a player that expensive, um, I feel like you should consider captaincy on him. And I haven't shown him here, but Nathan Cleary could also be a consideration if you're going for him straight away but I personally won't be doing that. Now, a quick shout out to our group league. If you haven't joined our group league, the code is just below me and I keep it there throughout all of the video. So um, shout out to Morgan, simply the best. He definitely had the best score for round three. He cracked 1,360. So he's ranked 510 overall, which is incredible. Um, I'm in a similar ranking, just add a couple of zeros after his 510. Um, and then we're almost tied neck and neck. Just taking a look at the overall standings for the group league, we've got Joshua, um, James, Mariah, Eli, and Morgan all sitting in the top like 520 overall places and they all scored pretty well last week so shout out to all of you guys um, let me know in the comments you know if you're there and if you're watching um, and let me know as well if any of my tips helped or they didn't help and so I 
kind of get a better sense for myself of what advice I should be giving or not. And so in the final section, as always, I'll quickly talk about my team and what I'm potentially looking at doing this week. And I'll try also put a bit more discussion around reserves. I haven't really talked about reserves so much, but given that I stumbled with my reserve picks last week, I thought it might be good to talk about. So say, for example, my team at the moment, I've got Josh King who's starting, I've got Targo, um, Schneider and Tedesco as my reserves. Um, I've got Stags and Cobo in my starting lineup, but I'll probably sub one of them out for Peter Hiku. So let me just do that right now, actually, because even though Hiku has got the Roosters, um, apart from last week, his base power average was pretty decent. So hopefully he can do something a little bit more. I feel like Nanai um, inside of him was just stealing all of the points, though. Um, so yeah, I've got the captaincy on Pappenhausen at the moment, and I've got vice captaincy on Fafida. And in terms of reserves, yeah, Tedesco is not going anywhere. Schneider, I think I'm confident playing just because he has got that high floor. Uh, Max King, I would reserve, but just because there's uh, a bit of a question mark around him coming into this week, I'm just going to hold off for now, um, and I'm happy enough with those four reserves. I don't feel very confident reserving Chris Randall. He just doesn't seem to be getting the minutes that we hoped he would get. So I'm probably sticking with these four reserves at the moment. Now, in terms of trades, so I haven't used my trade boost yet. I am thinking about using the trade boost this week just because it will help me get to someone like a Nico Hines if I do want him. Now, I know the Rooster draw is good, but I am thinking of doing the Sam Walker to Nico Hines move. And now I need to fund quite a bit of that money. So my thoughts were doing um, Katoni Stags out for, say, like a Tail in May. Just I like what I'm seeing. I'll definitely play a Tail in May in my team as well. Now, I could just do those two moves. Um, and that's, I could just leave it at that, have 58k in the bank, but I'm kind of sick of read Marnie, I'm not liking what I'm seeing, um, I might try to be a bit more logical, but I think Marnie is a sell, the only issue is that I'm short of going with Harry Grant, now, instead of going with Taylor May, I could go cheaper down to say like enough, 175k option, but no one's there standing out, I feel like Taylor May is the best downgrade option this week, so... I probably can't get Harry Grant in this week if I do want Hines, and I do think Hines is a slightly bigger priority trade-in than someone like Harry Grant. Also, keeping in mind that Harry Grant just had COVID, I don't think it would affect him massively, but we never know with something like COVID. So maybe that's just me talking myself into not going with Grant this week, but I feel like I can avoid it for this week. And so instead, what I can do, I can bring in someone like a Braley uh, or like a Tom Starling. That leaves me with about 132k in the bank. Uh, and that can just maybe help me build a bit of a bank up for, say, like a Nathan Cleary in the future, and or just give me a bit of a wiggle room just for future moves. If there's a player who all of a sudden stands out that I haven't got, having a, that decent amount of money in the bank can maybe help with that. So that was my first trade thoughts about using the trade boost. Um, I like all three players that I'm bringing in. Um, selling Stags and Marnie feels good. Selling Walker doesn't feel great, but I think the upgrade to Hines is probably worth it in my eyes. Now, one option I also did think about, instead of going with, say, like a Heinz, if I really did want Grant this week, now via Jules, I could actually get in Munster and Grant this week. So you can see I've got enough there to do that. And again, this is this is why it's a bit of a tougher call between Heinz and Munster in the sense that because of that money saving, you know, you could get both like Grant and Munster like I can in this situation. That leaves me 62k in the bank, but I've got two guns now in Grant and Munster. The only problem is that my halves now, Schneider would probably be my starting halfback. And that doesn't feel great. Um, but I do have Brown and Munster in my 5-8, which does feel good. But no Nico Hines. I feel like Hines is the best get this week. So while this looks good on paper, I feel like I want Hines more than, say, the combo of Munster and Grant. And I still think someone like a Braley could be a good option. I'd be keen to see what you guys think as well, actually, in the comments. Let me know um, which way you think I should go. But I am thinking of maybe doing this, but I'm leaning more towards the first option where I did Walker, Stags, and Marnie out for Heinz, Braley, slash Starling, uh, and Taylor May. Because those are my initial thoughts, I kind of want to stick with my initial thoughts and not try to overthink it too much. Um, so that's my kind of trade thoughts at the moment. And so yeah, these could be the three moves that I'm leaning towards just on my this side of the screen. <laughs> um, those are the trades that I'm thinking of this week. I'll try to post and confirm on Thursday what I end up doing. Um, I try to do it on Twitter as well. But these are my thoughts at the moment, guys. Hey guys, so I was actually editing the video and I realized um, I could have actually done something different with my trade plan. So I wanted to just quickly uh, chuck it in the back end here. So with my trade moves, I still think I'm leaning towards the Nico Hines uh, move in uh, and taking out Reed Miney as well. But I just thought about, um, in terms of actually generating extra cash, 
Instead of going with Tail and Maid this week, I could actually just go with Burr Furmore and my center wing as a Stags replacement. Given that he's got a negative replacement, um, all the benefits I mentioned with Furmore previously apply still. <laughs> um, nothing changed in the last hour since I'm re-recording this uh, trade little trade section here. But what I can do then, instead of going with Braley, I just go with Starling instead, just because I can't afford Braley um, in this particular situation. That leaves me with about 48k in the bank. It just means I get a little bit extra cash generation with Fermor, and it just means that next week then, I can do Cobo to Tail and May. Like, the Panthers do have the Rabbitohs this week, so it's not the easiest matchup on paper. So I'm thinking this actually could be the better way that I do it. I make a little bit extra money with Bo Fermor. I can plug him in in my center wing. Um, I've got the dual listing now between Tego and Fermor, which does help, because as you saw in my current setup, I've got both Aiken and Tego in my second row forward. So this adds that flexibility a little bit more. And then it would just mean next week I can do Cobo down to Tail and May. Still not enough yet to go for Harry Grant, but maybe that just could be the one move that I do next week. So yeah, these are my updated trade thoughts. As I was editing the video, I was like, wait, couldn't you just do that? And I thought, yeah, maybe I could. So I thought I'd throw it in into the end of the video, but I will end the video here now, guys. So um, I hope you did enjoy it. Um, and do give it a like and a thumbs up if you did like it and do subscribe as well if you are new around here. Uh, and I'll see you all in the next video and good luck for round four.